and welcome to the Anton Shofar channel. Upon this evening, we'll be discussing Shadows of the Antichrist, the Beast, Antiochus, Ephionis, and Hanukkah. Now, Hanukkah will begin on tomorrow, which is December 22nd. It will go through December 30th. In this lesson, we're going to examine how Antiochus, Ephionis really personify the soon coming son of perdition, the Antichrist, the man of sin. We're going to look at several aspects of the scripture in the book of Daniel. Also, too, we'll look at the Intertestament book of Maccabees to kind of go over how this is going to really play into end time prophecy and also to that the Antichrist will personify a lot of the characteristics of Antiochus. Now, before we get started, let's go over the story of Hanukkah. And when we look at the story of Hanukkah, it says, More than 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people lived in the land of Israel. They ruled by the Syrians who followed the Greek customs. They spoke Greek, read Greek books, and dressed like Greeks. Many of the Jews also began to accept Greek ways, including playing sports and games that were part of the worship of Greek gods. Then Antiochus, the Syrian king, ordered all the Jews to stop observing Jewish customs and laws and start worshiping the Greek gods. The Syrians desecrated the temple in Jerusalem, in the holiest place of the Jewish people, by setting up Greek idols and sacrificing pigs. Matthias of Modin led the revolt against the Syrians, and he was joined by his five sons, other brave Jewish rebels. After Matthias died, his son Judah became the rebels' leader and was known as Judah the Maccabee or Judah the Hammer. His fighters were called Maccabees. The Maccabees hid in the hills of Jerusalem, and they knew the best places were there to ambush the Syrian troops, who were much numerous and more heavily armed. The Maccabees fought hard for three long years, and finally they drove Antiochus' army out of Jerusalem. The Jews destroyed the Greek idols and cleansed the temple and relic its menorah and the candelabrum with the seven branches. On the 25th day of the Hebrew month of Keslev, they rededicated the temple to God. The Hebrew word for dedication is Hanukkah, which is how the holiday got its name. It's also called the Festival of Lights. Why people celebrate um, Hanukkah for eight days. Judah and his men model their dedication after the eight-day festival of Sukkot, which they had not been able to celebrate a few months earlier because the temple had been desecrated. The Talmudic legend suggests the second reason that we celebrate for eight days. It's because when the Jews returned to the temple, they found enough oil to light the menorah for only one day, but the oil lasted for eight days. Today, Hanukkah candle lighting proclaims the miracle of the temple restoration. Each Hanukkah menorah is designed to resemble the seven branch menorah of the temple, but with the eight branches to symbolize the eight days of Hanukkah, plus one extra for the Shema, the helper. So we see the menorah is the candlestick, which also when we look at the book of Revelation, when Jesus is talking about the seven churches removing um, them from the candlesticks is actually a menorah. So we see that. We also can look at the actual scriptures of John chapter 10, verse 22 through 30. Yeshua has celebrated the festival of lights or Hanukkah. And when we look at verse 22, it says, at the time the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon, and the Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, And I told you, and you do not believe. 
the works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I will give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand, and I, the Father, are one. So this is when Yeshua is proclaiming during the Feast of Dedication or during Hanukkah that Him and the Father are one. Also, during this Festival of Lights, Jesus says, not during this, but Jesus in in um, John, he does state that he is the light of the world. So he's the actual light of the world. So we move on. One of the things Yeshua talks about, and Yeshua was a prophet like unto Moses when he was up the Olivet Discourse, and he was speaking, one of the things that he touched upon was the abomination, desolation. Now, Yeshua being very well versed, being the word manifested in flesh, he knows definitely the word. So on the Olivet Discourse, he talks about the abomination, desolation, and he states this. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which one spoken of through Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Now, even in 70 AD, when Titus came and destroyed the temple, the believing Jews that remained in Jerusalem knew the scriptures and they began to flee out of Jerusalem before the destruction happened. Those who didn't follow Yeshua, they were prospering. They were going about their business. They looked like they were living a peaceful life. And then all of a sudden, sudden destruction came up on them. They were caught off guard. So that's why the word of God talks about when we look at the scriptures when Yeshua gives the parable of the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins, you have to maintain that oil burning in you. The word of God continue to burn inside of you to give you the sermon, to give you wisdom, to lead and guide you into all truth. Letting the Holy Spirit lead and guide you into all truth. So, we're going to see another abomination, the ultimate abomination of desolation when it comes down to this rebuilt temple which a lot of orthodox Jews are really building up to over in Israel they they're striving to get this thing done and the antichrist is going to go in and desecrate this temple and present himself as god so we're going to shift over to the book of Daniel, Daniel 8, verses 5 through 8. It says, while I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat was conspicuous, the horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns which has seen standing in front of the canal and rushed at him his mighty wrath. And I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him, and he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. So I'm going to stop right there. So here's Daniel. 
Daniel's a very unique prophet because unlike Isaiah, unlike Jeremiah, unlike Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah, they prophesy the first coming of Jesus. They prophesy the end times. They also prophesy the second coming of Jesus. However, with Daniel, Daniel prophesies the first coming of Jesus. He prophesies about the inner testament that happens in between the period of the old and the new testament he prophesies also about the end times and fourthly he prophesies the second coming of yeshua so when we look at the scripture it's talking about the media 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 persia or media um, persia empire being overcome by the nation of Greece has arose. Now, when we look at Daniel chapter 10, and it talks about the spiritual warfare that's going on. It talks about the Prince of Persia, and how I believe it was Gabriel, he wanted to deliver, or it was an angel that was wanting to deliver a message to Daniel. And it took him 21 days because he was fighting with the Prince of Persia. He says, when I go back, I would have to fight against the Prince of Grisha. So we see how Greece comes in and conquers Persia. And Greece was run through at this time, Alexander the Great, which he conquered most of the known world at this time and within I believe a 12 year period Alexander the Great dies suddenly and his kingdom is divided up through his generals so it's divided up through his four generals who take over his kingdom primarily the known generals of the four aspects of the kingdom were the um the Seleucid and the Ptolemy, which pretty much ruled Egypt, and the um, Seleucid ruled Syria and parts of Israel. And this is where we see where the four winds come up. And it's talking about the four horns are the four generals that take over after Alexander the Great passes away. So we move on. To Daniel 8 verses 9 through 14 with the little horn it says out of them came forth a rather small horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the beautiful land it grew up and the host of heaven caused some of the host of some of the stars to fall to earth and it trampled them down and it even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of hosts and they removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of the sanctuary was thrown down, and on the account of the transgression of the host will be given over to the horn, along with the regular sacrifice, it will be fleeing truth to the ground, and perform its will, and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy said to that particular one who was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply when the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. So this little horn that arises towards that rises up is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. It's also talking about the Antichrist, but it's it's talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. So when we look at the Hebrew or the Jewish prophets, when they're prophesying, and we look at the Word of God, it's patterns that's being followed. We can look how 
the book of Revelation mirrors the book of Daniel, some of the same patterns, even in the book of Revelation with some of the judgments. It mirrors the book of Exodus when Moses goes down to help deliver the children of Israel out of Egyptian captivity. Pharaoh is a type and shadow of Antichrist, and we see the judgments that take place during that. So when we're looking at this lesson with Antiochus and the Antichrist, you'll see the some of the same patterns are going to occur. So we look at first Maccabees um chapter one, verse one through five. It says after Alexander the Macedonian, uh, Philip's son, who came from the land of uh, Ketium, had defeated Darius the king of Persia and the Medes, he became the king in his place having first ruled in Greece. He fought many battles and captured the fortresses and put the kings of the earth to death. He advanced to the ends of the earth, gathering and plundering from many other nations, and the earth fell silent before him, and his heart became proud and arrogant. He collected a very strong army and won dominion over the provinces, nations, and rulers, and they paid him tribute. But after all this, he took to his bed and realizing that he was going to die. Verse 6 through 10, it says, So he summoned his noblest officers who had been brought up with him from his youth and divided his kingdom among them while he was still alive. And Alexander had reigned 12 years when he died. So his officers took over his kingdom, each in his own territory. And after his death, they all put on diadems, which are crowns. And so their sons after them for many years, multiplying evils on the earth. There sprung from these sinful offshoots Antiochus Ephionis, the son of King Antiochus, once hostage at Rome. He became the king in the 137th year of the kingdom of the Greeks. So here's the book of Maccabees shows that Daniel's prophecy is being fulfilled. This is one of the first fulfillments of Daniel's, um, the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, as we can see in Daniel chapter eight, and we'll soon look at Daniel chapter 11, how after Alexander the Great passes away. Uh, before he passes away, he uh, renders power to his four generals. But out of these four, eventually Antiochus arises as the little horn. So we look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and he says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of the abomination, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So, when we're looking at Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, the one week is talking about the tribulation period that will take place will take place in the end times. But also, too, we see that Antiochus Ephionis ends up causing the desolation or abomination desolation in the temple, which we'll further examine. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, it goes on to say, further confirmation, it says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be a thousand and two hundred and ninety days, so three and a half years. First Maccabees chapter one, verse 41 through 45, it says, then the king wrote to his whole kingdom 
that all should be one people, and abandon their particular customs, and all the Gentiles conform to the command of the king. And many of the Israelites delighted in his religion, and he sacrificed to the idols, and profaned the Sabbaths. And the king sent letters by the messenger to Jerusalem and to the cities of Judah, ordering them to follow the customs foreign to their land, to prohibit burnt offerings and sacrifices and lapidations in the sanctuary, to profane the Sabbaths and feast days. So before we go on, this is what the current time that we're looking in, looking at, that we see even... Christians are getting caught up into the world system. Let's be, you hear words, let's be relevant. Let's let's come together. Let's have unity. It's false unity because you can't really have true unity if um, under God if it's not under the, the umbrella of Jesus Christ. Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man can come to the Father unless he comes through me. So you have a ecumenical movement that's taking place within the Christian church where people are trying to gather together. Let's gather all the different religions together. There's more ways to heaven, whether you're a Buddhist, whether you're a Muslim, um, whether you're a Hindu, whether you're a Wiccan. There's all types of different ways to, to God if you're New Age. Um, and then also, too, getting caught up in the culture, because even when the scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove that which is good acceptable, perfect will of God. So true believers have to, especially this day and time, you can't get caught up in the world system and you have to really present your your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God and not be conformed to the ways of the world. So when we look at Verses 46 through 50, it says, To desecrate the sanctuary and sacred ministers, to build pagan altars and temples and shrines, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals, to lead their sons uncircumcised, to defile themselves with every kind of impurity and abomination, so that they might forget the law and charge its ordinance. Whoever refused to act according to the command of the king, was put to death. So we're we're about like living in that time. They're they're, they're telling Antioch is is enforcing that they not circumcise their sons, which circumcision was a sign of coming into a covenant relationship with Yahweh. Um, He's having them sacrifice swine and all types of unclean animals. Um, When we look what was taking place during this time of Antiochus reign and the Jews were getting caught up within being Hellenized, becoming more Greek than following the Mosaic law, following um, the word, following Yahweh. a lot of things that were taking place that Antiochus brought in. Antiochus brought in the Greek culture by Hellenizing the Jews through entertainment, through fashion, through building the gymnasiums. Um, now, we talk about sports in the gymnasiums. Um, when the Greeks perform our were doing athletic competitions, they did it naked. And also, too, one thing I want to say about the gymnasiums, that it brought a lot of homosexual activity that was taking place. So bringing in all the Greek culture, he was trying to also impose 
homosexuality and other sexual types, uh, appetites that didn't fit the context of the Mosaic Law. So when we look at Second Maccabees chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, it says, Not long after this, the king sent the Anthean senator to force the Jews to abandon the laws of the ancestors and to live no longer by the laws of God. He also profaned the temple in Jerusalem and dedicated to the Olympian Zeus and one to the mountain of Gerizim, to Zeus, the host to strangers, as the local inhabitants were wont to be. This was a harsh, utterly intolerable evil. The Gentiles filled the temple with debauchery and rivalry. They amused themselves with prostitutes and had intercourse with women, even the sacred courts. They brought forbidden things into the temple so that the altar was un, uh, was covered with abominable offerings prohibited by laws. No one can keep the Sabbath or celebrate the traditional feast, not, nor even admit to being a Jew. So this is very relevant in this day of time. You can, you can worship or serve any type of God or follow any type of religion. But when it comes down to just saying that not being, um, being part of inclusion, but being exclusively in Jesus Christ following Yeshua, that becomes an issue. So live in a day and time which is similar to what Antiochus Ephianus was doing to the Jews was you can worship all these different gods, but don't worship the true living God. Don't follow the word of God. Do all the things that you want to do. You can you can live a life, an immoral lifestyle and and follow all the different gods and enjoy um, this world right now, the things of the world. And do a kind of things that are against the word of God and just become part of the culture. When we look at 2 Maccabees 6, verse 7 through 10, it says, Moreover, at the monthly celebration of the king's birthday, the Jews, from a bitter necessity, had to partake of the sacrifices when the festival of Dionysus was celebrated. They were compelled to march in his procession and wearing wreaths of ivy. Following upon the vote, the citizens of the Ptolemus, a decree was issued ordering the neighboring Greek cities to adopt the same measures, obliging the Jews to partake of the sacrifices and putting to death those who would not consent to adopt uh, the customs of the Greeks. It was obvious, therefore, that the disaster had come upon them. Thus, two women who were arrested for circumcising their children were publicly paraded about the city with their babies hanging at their breasts, and they were thrown down from the top of the city wall. So we see this how that we live in a day and age where people call evil good and good evil. And we also see how when people stand up for righteousness, where um, the school system, where their kids are being taught all types of of ungodly um, things within the curriculum and parents stand up, um, parents are criticized and they're made to, made to seem like they're bigots and other things and all. And they flip it over. And also, too, in a lot of other countries, we see people are being persecuted for the namesake of the Lord, they're being persecuted because they love Jesus. We can see this over in China. We can see this over in parts of Nigeria with uh, Boko Haram is persecuting Christians um, over there. We can see parts of that in some of these Islamic countries 
where Christians are being uh, persecuted. We can see this even in Iran, where um, the Christians are being persecuted for trying to stand up for the namesake of the Lord. And even in India, where Hindus are arising, wanting to make um, Hinduism the main central religion of India. So they're trying to put a squeeze on Christians. So they want to prevent Christians or prevent the children of God from really following and observing the ways and the word of God. So we see this taking place um, during the reign of Antiochus, how he imposes all these ungodly laws, these godless laws um, upon the Jews and those who did not submit to being Hellenized by following these Greek gods, these foreign gods, um, which Paul talks about in, I believe, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 20, that these gods are actually demon gods, so they're following, instead of following demons, they wanted to follow the true living God. Now, Antiochus, he sacrificed a pig in the temple on the altar of Zeus. Now, Antiochus captured Jerusalem in 167 BC and desecrated the temple by offering a sacrifice of a pig on the altar of Zeus, which is the abomination of desolation. So uh, one of the main things with the pig, it was an unclean, considered an unclean animal. We look at Leviticus chapter 11, verses 4 through 8. It lists the swine among this, um, one of the unclean mammals. He also erected an idol of Zeus in the Jewish temple. Which we look at the Ten Commandments. Um, one of the things you should have no other God before me. Um, you shouldn't make anything that's a graven image. So here, here he is not having any proper respect for the Jewish people and their love for God, those who are hanging on to the faith, he persecuted. So we're going to see this in the last days, more and more persecution that's going to take place, um, more and more um, laws in place, even here in America, that's going to cut down and some of our civil liberties, but they want to cut down if you're not going to be like the lukewarm church that's going to incorporate a bunch of ungodly things and all the, the true church. You're going to be persecuted. And we see here how he establishes, he established a false worship system. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to be worshiped. He wants to be like the most high God. He wants to, he wants to, um, exalt himself. So here we see Antiochus starts this. Also, too, during these persecutions, Menelaus, the high priest, was at Antiochus' side. He was there when the swine and other unclean beasts were burnt on the temple altar as sacrifice to the Greco Roman gods. So Menelaus. He was an agent for Jason, the high priest. I'm kind of going to backtrack. Um, Jason's name, that's his Greek name, but his Hebrew or his Jewish name was um, Jesus or Yeshua. He came from a family of priests um, from the line of Zadok. But his brother Onus was the priest and the high priest at that time. And Onus pretty much followed the Mosaic law, tried to live righteous. But Yeshua, 
he wanted to become the high priest, and he is he is very much into Greek um, culture. So he paid Antiochus money to actually become the high priest over his brother. Well, during that time period of time where he sent Menelaus, which was not part of the priestly line, he is a Benjamite, to take money to Antiochus to solidify him self being the high priest this is Jason or Yeshua Menelaus goes behind his back and outbids Jason for being a high priest so Antiochus incorporates him being the high priest in Israel at that time and eventually Jason is killed because when Antiochus goes down into Egypt, which we look at the scriptures that Antiochus um, is the king of the north, goes down from Syria into Egypt to the south. Um, it's rumored that he's killed. So Jason believing that Antiochus is dead overthrows. Jerusalem and Antiochus finds out because Jason ends up killing most of the Menelaus men who were on Menelaus' side and Antiochus goes back to Jerusalem in a fierce way and he ends up killing um, Jason um, which Jason was the last um, line of Zadok priesthood. Um, so. Menelaus is a type of the second beast. So we see pigs. Let's digress back into the pig sacrifice. Pigs were commonly sacrificed in Greco-Roman religious rites, and the offering of a pregnant soul was part of the fertility ritual. So there's two things when we look at the sacrifice that Antiochus Ephionis does when he sacrifices a pig on the altar of Zeus. Number one, it's against scriptures. It's against the Mosaic law because it was unclean. But also, two, within these mystery religions, a pig was seen as a fertility ritual. So he was doing two parts. He was doing a ritual within the temple. Also, too, the homage could be um, paid to a Roman god for the sport battle by sacrificing a boar along a ram and an ox on the altar of Mars. So, also, too, the blood of a suckling pig was also part of the initiation rituals of Elasius. So you see how all this plays into a part how Antiochus Ephionis, um, with the abomination desolation, he erects a idol of Zeus and he sacrifices a pig. He's doing a satanic or demonic ritual within the temple, which desecrates or is an abomination. Now, Antiochus Ephionis, along with erecting an idol of Zeus, he desecrates the temple by erecting the statue of Zeus, which was the chief um, Greek god. And ironically, he uses some of his own facial features to go on this idol. So Antiochus, the some of the likeness of Zeus, his facial features resemble Antiochus. So this goes into what we see in scripture where the son of perdition will go into the temple and present himself as God. This 
we'll we're gonna look more into Antiochus and even his name. So when we see Daniel chapter eleven, verse thirty-one, it says, "And the arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and they shall take away the deadly sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate." So that's what Antiochus Ephianus did. He polluted the sanctuary. He did it. He took away the daily sacrifices that the Jews were supposed to do inside the temple, and he made the temple desolate. As we read before Matthew 24 and 15, when you therefore shall see the abomination desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso, whoso readeth, let him understand. And the Menelaus, the high priest. Let's look at Menelaus. We've kind of discussed him a little bit, but let's go ahead and discuss him in a little bit more detail. Um, during all these persecutions, Menelaus, the high priest, was at Antiochus' side, and he was there when the swine and other unclean beasts were burnt on the temple altar as a sacrifice to the Greco Roman gods. In the year 168 BC, Antiochus capped his religious reforms by replacing the Jewish altar with one dedicated to Zeus. Antiochus saw himself as the head of all Greeks and Romans who worshipped Zeus and named himself Manifested Zeus. In honor of both God and King, a pig was sacrificed in the temple on the 25th day of the Jewish month uh, Kislev, since the priests were the officiants in these rites, since Menelaus had schemed to keep the office of the high priest, it was likely that he was the administrator of these ceremonies. So we can see how this is building up to Menelaus is the type and shadow of the false prophet, the second beast. Menelaus is described as having the passion of a cruel tyrant, the rage of a savage beast. Second Maccabees um, chapter 4, verse 25. He stole some of the vessels of the temple for the purpose of meeting his obligation to Antiochus. And when he was rebuked by the late high priest for sacrilegious, he was said to have procured his murder. So, he personifies Satan. What is it? He's a thief. Satan comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. He also is the father of lies. So we see that Menelaus and Antiochus personify by both. Also, too, both these men love Antiochus was using not just he cut down, he was he was taking money, both him and Menelaus was taking money from the temple because the temple had a lot of money that was coming through it. And he was using the money. That goes to show you what the scripture says. It says, the love of money is the root of all evil. So one of the things that motivated these men was the love of money. We can also see within the person of of Judas of Iscariot, Judas personifies a type and shadow of Antichrist also too, because Judas had a love of money also too. So that's one of the motivations that we see within these men. But we look at Second Maccabees chapter four, verses twenty three through twenty five. It says three years later Jason sent Menelaus the brother of aforementioned, which we've already discussed, but I'm um, recapping is it says aforementioned Simon to deliver the money to the king and to complete the negotiations of an urgent matter. But after his instruction to the king, he flattered him with such an air of authority that he secured the high priesthood for himself, outbidding Jason by 300 talents silver. He returned with the royal commission 
but nothing that made him worthy of the high priesthood. He had temper of a cruel tyrant and the rage of a wild beast. Menelaus, again, he personifies this second beast. When we look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 through 12, it says, And behold, another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spake as a dragon. He exercised all the power of the first beast before him. He causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So, Menelaus is the is a type of shadow of the second beast. He is the religious figure, and Antiochus Epiphanes is the political figure. So you have the political figure, and you have the religious figure. You have Menelaus is the one that institutes this Greek mystery, Babylon religions, this false religious system to these demon gods sacrificing these un- unclean um, animals, which is um, symbolic of uh, incorporating unclean beasts. When we look at the book of Revelation, it talks about um, Babylon has become a place of unclean unclean spirits. So it symbolizes bringing in all these unclean things in there. So he is the one that has, has instituted this false worship system that leads to the worship of these false gods and also to, to honor Antiochus Ephionis, this type of antichrist. Now, Antiochus the fourth for Antiochus Ephionis, he had his own coin. So on the coin, it has Theos Ephionis declaring him to be God manifested. So he believed that he was Zeus or he Zeus manifested or he was God manifested. So just like the Antichrist will be satanically possessed and present himself in the temple as God. This is a foreshadow of Antiochus somewhat. He didn't present himself as God, but he put some of his face, um, facial features on the idol of Zeus, um, thinking that he was like the embodiment of a a god. So we can see this building up, this how people are really going to be duped and taken in by this. And just like Antiochus, um, Ephionis, when we look at Daniel chapter 11, um, he fulfills pretty much from Daniel chapter um, 11, verse 20 through 35, um, Antiochus is is talking about the reign of um, Antiochus from that point of time. He goes, he conquers, he, he's from the north, he goes down, he conquers Egypt, um, he uses flattery, he uses all these different things. But another, um, another thing that Antiochus, Ephionis, his enemies thought of him as a madman, so they sh- took a letter out from his name as Epimens, which means madman. So he was a madman. So um, he acted like a beast, just very violent and very um, was willing to put out anybody that came against him. We look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. It says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called, 
and all that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is God. So we can see some of the Jews, they begin to get caught up in Greek culture. They begin to fall away from following the laws of Moses, following Yahweh, um, loving Yahweh. Um, they begin to follow Antiochus Ephionis, and eventually he end up going in and desecrating the temple. Same thing's going to happen with the Antichrist, the the beast. He's you're going to see when it's talking about a falling away because Satan already has the church, but this is talking about people that were once in the faith of Jesus Christ, they're going to fall away and they're going to be given over to a strong delusion where they'll believe a lie versus the truth. Just like these Jews during the day of Antiochus Ephionis, they were willing to believe a lie instead of the truth and they end up following this madman straight to hell. So we see that this soon coming Antichrist will, he wants worship, which Satan always wanted. He wanted to be like the most high. He wants to sit on the throne and we're, you're going to see this actually manifest itself in the soon coming days. Now, 3 Maccabees um, chapter 2, verse 24 through 26, it says, When in the course of the time he come to himself, the severe check caused no repentance within him, and he departed with bitterness, or bitter threatenings. He proceeded to Egypt and grew worse in wickedness, and through his previously mentioned companions in wine, who were lost in all goodness and not satisfied with countless acts and penity, his audacity, so he increased that he raised evil reports there, and many of his friends watching his purpose attentively joined and furthering his will. His purpose to inflict a public stigma upon our race, therefore he erected a stone pillar in the courtyard, and caused the following inscription to be engraved upon it. The entrance to this temple, it is to be refused to all those who would not sacrifice. All Jews were to be registered among the slaves, those who resisted to be forcibly seized and put to death. Those who are, are, those who are thus registered are to be marked on their person by the ivy leaf of the symbol of Dionysus and to be reduced to the limited rights. So here we have Antiochus Ephionis. He really celebrated the god Zeus, but he also celebrated Dionysus. So we see down in Egypt, um, the Ptolemy, which he had took over um, Egypt, and he was ruling Egypt but they begin to enforce Jews that lived in Egypt to take the mark of Dionysus, which they branded them with the ivy leaf symbol of Dionysus and marked them as slaves. So when we look at branding or tattoos, um, back in ancient times, um, if to reverence a dead one or reverence of God, you took you took a mark. If you're a prisoner, you're a slave, you took a mark. Uh, so even when we look at that, what's what's ironic with this, the mark of Dionysus, that people that didn't take the mark or take the symbol of Dionysus weren't marked. They were put to death. We see this in the book of Revelation. So we move on. 
So we can see this is the actual type in Shadow also too that they begin ultimately with the mark of the beast. It's going to be incorporated worldwide. You're not going to be able to buy nor sell. So it's going to be not just part of the economic system, but it's going to be part of the religious system. So when we look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 15 through 17, it says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. The image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not to worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and on their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So we hear a lot about Man, you know, what's your brand? Branding yourself. When the beast arises, when these beasts, the first and the second, this political beast and this religious beast, how you brand yourself out there on Instagram and all this other stuff, the only main brand on on this particular time when this man of sin arises is you're going to you're going to be wearing his brand you're going to be branded with the mark of the beast because you look at how the economic system is um it's a paper system which is very flimsy that's another lesson that we can go within ourselves because pretty much the economic system is built on the Babylonian banking system based on alchemy, making something out of nothing. You print money, put it in circulation. When you need money, you print it out. So the sense of a magic system that takes place, but you have these international banks that these nations, including the United States, have built so much debt that you need money for for military actions or um, you need something like we saw like the mortgage crisis that took place, all these banks falling, you print all this money out. These, these institutions are charging these nations this interest. So when it collapses, they come in with a new system. You're going to be a slave to the system because even in Proverbs chapter 22 verse 7 it says the rich rule it over the poor and the bar is a servant to the lender so when this B system comes in and you're not going to be able to eat because if you don't take the mark of the beast you're going to be killed, just like we see with the Jews who opposed following the different Greek gods and taking the mark of Dionysus. They, they were killed. Those who took the mark, they were enslaved, but they were able to participate in the economic system and, and different things that took place. Um, you're going to be a slave to the Antichrist system, the beast system, and you're going to worship the son of perdition as God. And you may be able to eat, but you've sold your soul out for eternal damnation. So who is Dionysus, this God that they were taking this Dionysus uh, leaf, ivy leaf, uh, Mark. Dionysus was the ancient Greek god of wine and winemaking, grape cultivation, fertility, ritual madness, theater, and religious ecstasy. He's the Roman name of Bacchus.
uh, Dionysus is the god of drama and entertainment. Um, the great Dionysia is called the city of Dionysia, the ancient dramatic festival in which tragedy, comedy, and satiric drama originated. It's held in Athens in March in honor of Dionysus, the god of wine. So when Antiochus Ephion um, and began to Hellenize the Jews there in Israel, <coughs> he incorporated entertainment. They begin to get caught up in entertainment, sports, all these different things that we see not bad during this time or time that we live in, but it becomes a distraction and the other things and all. But also too, the entertainment was used to deliver a message as we see in today's time to help program, to help indoctrinate uh, message that's going going on that that is really diametrically opposed to the word of God. So we see most of the stuff that Hollywood produces is diametrically opposed to the word of God, the entertainment industry, the music industry, which is part of entertainment. On the most part, it's diametrically opposed to the word of God. Um, we can see um, most of the music videos that you see is laced with a um, bunch of satanic symbolism, Illuminati symbolism, all these different things that are incorporated in that is to to help prep people and program people for the rise of the Antichrist. So it's counterproductive. So we see that Dionysus was, he is the actual god of entertainment and of wine. Now Dionysus was the god of wine. And it's this Dionysus followers would engage in wild frenzies and rites often at night. I'm gonna stop there because the Bible talks about being sober, having a sober mind. Um Word of God talks about be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So you become intoxicated. Um, you even look at alcohol, on the most part, it's called spirits. So in ancient times, people believed when they were partaking of drinking alcohol beverages to become intoxicated, that they were intaking these different gods, these different spirits. <coughs> but we go ahead and we read on. Under the influence of wine and ecstasy, some will call or say sexual ecstasy as well. Revelers became one with their God even after they ascended to Olympus. His followers can still see Dionysus often in the form of a bull or a goat in a vision brought um, by their religious rites. In the orgastic celebration of Dionysus and his mostly female followers, women sometimes suckled gazelles, wolves, fawns, and kids. At other times, they engaged in sporogamos, a term used for a ritual dismemberment of living animals, ripping cows, goats, or sheep to pieces with their bare hands and eating them raw. So even look what's going on in today's time. I'll use, for example, the drug, um, not wine, but a drug, flaca. You know, you get these people that are get high out of their mind on um, flaca and are PCP, and they're able to do feats that you would never break stuff, break chains, break handcuffs. Uh, you see people, these bath salts and all these other things, uh, chew off people's face. Um, these these women 
would get so intoxicated that they would go and that's strictly demonic possession where you go and you're able to rip an animal to pieces with your bare hands and eat it raw. That is that is some serious demonic possession that's going on. So we'll see the rise of pharmacia that's taking place, um, the use of uh, illicit drugs, other things that is occurring. And even when you look at Revelation chapter 9, verse, I believe, verse 20 and 21, how they repented not of their sorceries, of their pharmacia and all. They repented not of the worship of demons. Um, more and more people are, like we're looking at uh, Antiochus, Ephionis, and bringing in all these false gods. More and more people, not just drugs, but more and more people are getting into worshiping demons. Uh, even you're seeing um, the demon god Moloch pop up a whole lot more and within the last few years. Um, you're seeing that some of these ancient gods, which are demons, are coming back to the forefront. And we see that the book of Revelation is definitely on the horizon where you're going to see things that you've never seen uh, before. Dionysus is similar to the Baphomet goat god. Dionysus was reputed to be half human, half beast, half male, and half female. I find this uh, kind of ironic is because also, too, we see within the times that we live in and we see how um, that Dionysus was one of Antiochus Ephionis' patron gods besides Zeus, that um, Dionysus is also seen as the son of Zeus, but being half human, half half beast, half male, half female, we see the Baphomet spirit arising where people are talking about, we see people are androgynous, are the gender fluid, um, you see men up in ways, one of, one of the things that caused somewhat of a controversy um, just a few months ago. Um, Pharrell um, on the GQ magazine dressed in a dress and is androgyny and is personifying the spirit of Baphomet in these last and evil days. You see women dressing as men, men dressing as women. So many things that are taking place and we see the spirit becoming more prevalent or we see that transitioning where people are trans transgender is coming to a forefront. This is just a fulfillment of the days and times that we're living in, that we're definitely living in the last days. The difference between Antiochus Ephionis and the Antichrist, the first beast, let's read Daniel chapter 11, verse 37 through 38. It says, neither shall be regarded, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and the pleasant things. So I'm going to stop right there. One difference between Antiochus, Ephionis, and the Antichrist, the first beast that we see in Revelation chapter 13, Antiochus did regard the God of his fathers. He regarded the Greek gods. He regarded Zeus. He 
regarded Dionysus, he regarded um, Apollo, all these different Greek gods he did regard. However, the son of perdition, the one, the ultimate Antichrist, will not regard any other God. He will magnify himself above all, which Paul touches upon, which we already read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And he will honor the God of forces. So let's examine who the God of forces is. So we already established that the difference between Antiochus, Ephionis, and the Antichrist is the Antichrist will exalt himself above every God and will present himself as God instead of somebody else like Zeus and all these other false gods. So who is the God of forces? Freemasons adore the figure of the Baphomet, a half-man and half-goat creature, in which in reality represents the god of forces or the devil. So the god of forces that, the, that Daniel is talking about, that this man of sin or this person is going to honor, is the devil himself, it's the dragon, it's the serpent that he's going to to honor. So the power that this ultimate beast will come in will be under the power, it'll be, he'll, he will be satanically energized. He'll be eventually sat satanically possessed by Satan himself. We see in scriptures only we'll see the Antichrist, the first beast possessed by Satan. We saw how Judas was possessed by Satan, and he will he'll be so overtaken, so satanically possessed, so um, sinister. So this God of forces, we're knowing that it's not it's a different God. It's a God that his fathers did not know. This man of sin will be honoring the devil himself, and he'll be doing his bidding. To conclude, 1 John chapter 2, verses, verse 18, it says, Little children, it is in the last time, as he, ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now, there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So, there's been many Antichrists. Through the ages, the spirit of Antichrist has been long for eons and eons through Pharaoh, through, I'm just using examples, through Pharaoh, through Antiochus Ephionis, through Hitler, through Stalin, through Mussolini, through Idi Amin. All these different individuals has personified the spirit of Antichrist and their 